Uh, Harry Bhatia is uh, CEO, uh, co-founder of Radio Wala Network, which is actually curating music for more than 350 retail uh, brands and uh, going into a number of outlets, and I'm sure he would talk about this. But uh, he sets the premise in terms of why music is so important in the retail experience today. Uh, then we have Petal Chandok from Trust Legal uh, Advocates and Consultants, who's really going to put some lights on, on how music licensing and music rights is working, and that's a gamut of information there, but I think we try to cover key aspects on, on that front. Uh, we have Yuri, uh, who represents, or rather, CEO, founder, evangelist, DJ Monitor, which is a global, globally pioneering uh, tech platform, which is uh, into rights, uh, into track identification and then rights monitoring. So he really brings in about how to monitor these tracks and across venues or retail outlets. And uh, finally, we have. Uh, Sharad Puri, uh, GM JW Marit Juhu, thank you so much, sir, for having us and helping us with this conference. Please, sir, could you just take your seats and we could really start. So, uh, without further ado, and I'm sure we'd like to wrap up as much as we could and share as much information as we could, I'd like to start with Harry. Uh, you have, uh, you've been curating music uh, for, through your tech platform for so many retailers and outlets. Uh, let's first understand how is really music helping a retail experience of a customer? Is it so important? And is there really, uh, is it just passive listening and just entertainment quotient? Or is there really something that really helps customer in their buying experience? Thanks, Amit. As the time shows, we are already 12 minutes over time. Okay, so <laughs> let's start quickly. Uh, Having worked in uh, music industry and uh, retail industry, as personal experience has been that uh, music is a must-have for a retail environment. It's not good to have, it's a must-have. Uh, why does it say so? Uh, there have been enough research which has shown that uh, in a retail environment, three things are very critical for any consumer. First is the product itself. Now, People are coming in for that product into the store. Second is the music, the sound of that retail store. How does it sound when they when you enter into? Does it resonate with the kind of product it is being sold, or it is totally you know disarray uh, as compared to the product? And third is the smell. If the store doesn't smell good, customers will walk out. Now, music. Any customer who is walking into a retail environment uh, typically is coming from a chaos outside on the street. Parking, there's somebody is like, you know, it's raining and everything. Once you enter the store, the music has to calm you down. So, or it has to resonate, okay, if you are going in for a product which is, you know, kind of, you want to spend time, you want the music to help you out as well. In a recent uh, research, in any retail experience, I think more than the shopping, the checkout is a pain point. You spend a lot of time in the queue. And that's when if you hear a pleasant music, you know, it, it enhances the experience. Uh, we work with now more than 350 retail brands across 15,000 odd retail stores. Uh, I think the brands typically want that if a customer is walking into a store in Bombay or in Mumbai or in Delhi or in Kanpur, they should have a straight connect with the brand through the music. So it's not that, you know, a different kind of musics are getting played in different retail stores of the same brand. So that's a key thing uh, which a retailer expects from a service provider like us. Earlier they used to just send out CDs, but there was no control or checkpoint if the store manager is playing the same sound or not because it was left to the decision of the store staff and the store manager. With service providers like us, you know, typically we ensure that there is nothing left at the store level to manage. Everything is managed from our end. And this solves two problems or pain points of the retailers. First is the music licensing. Uh, this control at a single point enhances the compliance with all the legal uh, rights of what the brands have taken for the music. And because we give them real-time dashboard on what is getting played at each of the store. So 
So from a PPL or a regulator point of view also, there is compliance of the music. So that's a pain point which we solve for the retailers. And second is the standardization. So if the brand resonates with a lounge music or a uh, Hindi music, we ensure that the same thing gets played and there's no piracy. And is it something that the brand defines of what, uh, what, what is the music that works or you help them really curate this music depending on what the consumers are really... So we do, our creative and content team sits with the brand manager and the CEOs and understand the profile of their customers and post that we design the whole, the playlist and the day part, like morning what kind of tempo of music, how it will pep up in the evening, depending on the brand and depending on the time of the day. That's, that's just fantastic. And I think one point that Harry made uh, while there is, uh, while the importance of music across retail is really said there, but one important part he said about was licenses. And uh, on that petal, I would like to come to you and really understand what kind of, uh, what are the rights and licenses required when you're using a playlist for a public usage? And I think there's always a lot of information, always a lot of confusion. We'd like to just explain us a little in a simpler terms, considering we are all, all uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody's not really would understand the uh, nitty gritties, but at least in layman terms, what are these rights that you require when you're playing this music? So, uh, Samit, the fact that uh, Harry was also sharing that when you are in a store or when you are in a a uh, public place, you know, you play songs and of course you need licenses for that. So, uh, just to segregate that, uh, one is when you are playing songs at home and in that obviously you don't need any licenses. But the moment uh, you play these songs in a public place, that is where you need uh, licenses because that is being done for entertainment, that is being done uh, and you are, you know, the, the one who is playing it will be commercially benefited out of it. So, uh, these licenses are very important. So, right now, uh, if you look at the condition of licenses in the country, uh, we have societies that are in place. We have, uh, we have PPL, which is Phonographic Performance Limited. We have ISRA, which is Indian Singers Rights Society. Uh, this is a society which, is, which consists of all the singers, you know, mostly all the singers. And, um, and then there is uh, IPRS, which is Indian Performers Rights Society, where all the performers, like authors, writers, composers, they are part of it. So, uh, these, are the, these are the societies who really claim, uh, you know, licenses, uh, license fees, as well as royalties from, uh, you know, from these third party platforms or, uh, you know, whatever uh, platform we are playing these musics from, because they are the ones who uh, essentially hold, uh, I mean, claim to hold these rights. But of course, uh, right now, there is, a, there is ambiguity because there are multiple societies and each artist claims that they have the right, but uh, uh, still there are litigations going on. There are music labels who claim that, you know, it's their rights. So uh, what happens mostly is that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, everyone starts taking all kind of licenses under, under the, uh, you know, in order as an abundant caution because nobody wants to really cause any sort of... Uh, uh, you know, detriment in one's uh, program or etc. Sure. So, in th those situations, what happens is you start spending more. So, right now, the licensing situation in the country is not very clear, even though there are societies in place. But uh, I think people end up uh, spending more because uh, they just want to be a little extra cautious. Yeah. Sure. Uh, on, on that note, I'd come to you, Shara, then really first understanding how, uh, how music is really helping you to create a culture and environment in, your, in a hotel industry or a hospitality industry like this. And also, how are you handling the whole licensing uh, part of the business? So, I think we, uh, in a hotel, the one most important thing is the, the environment, the ambience that we create. Uh, and it's all the five senses and music plays a large role. And, uh, I will admit that uh, music plays a large role in our food and beverage sales. Uh, and if you would go to a lounge, the music that is played in the lounge at 7 p.m. is different than at 11 p.m. And that just helps our food and beverage sale. Uh, so, uh, the other thing we also look at from music point of view, each, each area, each space will need different kind of music, uh, time of the day, 
uh, breakfast is different, lunch is different, dinner is different, what kind of a space we have. So we, we are very particular about what music is required, very unique, very specific needs as Harry mentioned as well. You right. know, same so your so your all day cafe plays something else. Absolutely. Your your lobby would play something else. There's complete. And yeah. how do you go about the curation for this? Is there like a team who really curates this? So we have people who curate this for us. Uh, and at the end of it, you know, the hotel uh, team uh, really, along yeah. with myself, and we would give a brief of how we would want it to be. So in Italian restaurant, we would like to play something which is more Italian. In an Indian restaurant, of course, sure. Indian. And, and based on, again, time of the day. So we, we do it ourselves. We do a lot of, we give a lot of direction ourselves, but it's curated by somebody else, of course. Okay. And how do you work about the licensing? Do you really approach the uh, PPL or is there agencies that you really develop? Yeah, so as, you know, we, we do everything. Yeah, I wish it was a little easier. Uh, okay. But we do everything. And uh, I think one big part for a hotel is the events that we do. And uh, we want to be safe and all our guests want to be safe and we just put a caution to say, you know, if you're going to do this, if you're going to play this music, get this license, this license, this license. And a lot of times the guests would say, you know, I don't want all this headache, let me, let me not play music. Got it. So that I think, I think is a big deterrent. So, uh, so there is… And, and, and really goes against the artist. Sure. Yeah, because, sure. you know, at the end of it, we also, I think it's, it's important that the artists get the due recognition at the end of it. Understood. Yuri, I'm going to come to you and before that, I'll just ask Harry once, once again. Harry, when it comes to these licenses, how easy is it in terms of procurement of these licenses? Is it economical for a retail brand to really invest in this? Do they have concerns that, no, this is too expensive? Uh, how do you really tackle that and what are this? So, I think uh, the compliance over the last six, seven years since we started the service has improved. Uh, earlier, people were just making CDs and just sending it to their stores. Sure. And, you know, if someone comes and then they will handle it at that time. But I think uh, over the years, at least the organized retailers, they have started taking licenses. Uh, today, there is confusion in the market on what all licenses they need to take. So the Retailers Association of India is working very closely uh, with the licensing agencies as well to educate uh, the retailers on what licenses. Uh, primarily today, PPL license is being taken by everyone. Uh, IPRS, after the Copyright Act amendment, uh, has staked a claim as well on the same uh, music which is getting played over there. But uh, as Petal said, there are still legal cases pending for it. Uh, PPL has uh, over the years put the rate card on the net so people are aware of what the rates are uh, there used to be delay in issuance of licenses now they are making it a digital license so there is continuous improvement on how to engage and increase the compliance as neeraj mentioned in the previous that the music industry market size is pretty small but licenses and you know we have like almost 20 million retail outlets and right now, the compliance may be happening in maybe 50,000 outlets. Okay, that's a... So, difference. to that extent, there is a very long journey ahead, but uh, it's a huge market potential for everyone. But usually you take it, uh, depending on the uh, songs you play, or is it a blanket license? How does that license go for a, for a retail outlet? So, typically it is, as I said, uh, people take PPL license, so, uh, or a label license, but PPL uh, cover some 275 labels, uh, music right. labels. So if you take PPL license, you can play any song from their repertoire. Got it. And there is Novex, which is some 10 odd labels are with them. So if you take Novex license, then only those 10 music labels. But it's a kind sure. of a blanket license. You play any song from their repertoire. Sure. Well, I think I'm going to come back to you in terms of understanding the economics of how you pay for this. But uh, on that note, Yuri, I would like to uh, come to you and understand how is DJ Monitor really simplifying this issue in terms of monitoring as well as uh, rights licensing? Uh, how do you really take that through with the platform tech that you have? Well, maybe it's uh, good to uh, show the video first because... Uh, sure, on that note, words. Yuri has a video to be played. Console, can you play, play the video? PPL and PRS for Music play a vital role at the heart of the music industry, ensuring music creators are paid fairly when their music is played in public. As the music industry evolves, we're constantly innovating to adapt. Now, working alongside bars, clubs and events across the country, 
technology is helping to improve the way that music creators are paid from performances in clubs. DJ sets are spontaneous and varied, changing from gig to gig, which can make it difficult for DJs to tell us what they play. Mr. Sound started life nearly 30 years ago as a nightclub in Elephant Castle in South London. So we are wholly supportive of music recognition technology going into bars and clubs so that the right people get paid. A small recognition device listens to the music a DJ plays and analyzes it against a database of millions of individual sound recordings, creating highly accurate setlist information. PPL and PRS for Music then use this setlist information to distribute royalties back to the creators of those recordings and works. Devices are installed quickly and securely by our qualified audio engineer at no cost to the venue or event promoter and can be adapted to accommodate almost all technical specifications. I'm B Traits. I am a music producer, DJ and radio presenter. I play mostly underground dance music, so leaning towards more techno, breaks, jungle, but I am a very eclectic uh, artist and very eclectic taste. So it's really, really important for clubs to start backing uh, this kind of thing. From a DJ's point of view, music recognition technology is completely private and secure. The information captured will never be made public. It's only going to be used to pay those artists whose music you played. We've released music for 20 years now, so we have an extensive catalogue. Um, I hear my records in bars, boutiques, nightclubs. So every time my music gets played, there should be some kind of return or remuneration for that because the people that create the music deserve to get paid. I mean, it's an art form music, it's a creative process, and you should be paid for creativity. So music recognition technology enables us to track all of the plays. The music comes first every time. Sorry. I thought that uh, Pete Tong could uh, narrate it a lot better than I can. Um, basically, this is um, uh, what we are doing in the UK for uh, PRS for Music and uh, PPL. And uh, we're doing a big variation of, of, of venues ranging from pubs, <coughs> Sorry. Ranging from pubs to uh, events to uh, nightclubs like Ministry of Sound, Fabric, etc. So we try to get the, the full picture here. Um, our product is very simple. Through technology, we are able to create data. And through data, we are able to create transparency. And transparency is what's needed in order to create a fair licensing tariff, as well as uh, the correct distribution towards the uh, rightful uh, uh, artists and composers. Okay. And uh, just in terms of understanding while the rights, and Petal really put some uh, insight in terms of rights, how it's handling in India, but just your ex uh, understanding in terms of how are they being handled internationally, uh, uh, in, in probably UK or US in the markets that you're working on? Well, US works a little bit different than, uh, than the other markets, but um, in generally speaking, you have um, uh, author rights, and author rights are usually uh, the rights uh, that go to the composers and lyricists. They write the music. A good example is if uh, uh, the, the author of uh, New York, New York uh, wrote their songs and then a whole bunch of people uh, covered it, like Frank Sinatra, etc. Meaning that Frank Sinatra is an artist. Hey, um, in, in this case, we have the neighboring rights because the neighboring rights then go to the artists and record labels, etc. So uh, the, to the actual performers. And then there's something called uh, master rights. And the master rights are the, um, the rights of the, the, the entity that owns the master rights, usually the record label. And the record labels come together and they have uh, founded this platform, IFPI. And, <coughs> sorry. and IFPI um, basically um, has their music represented as neighboring rights through entities like PPL. Understood. So, so uh, anytime right? you play music, you have to pay both the writers, the composers, you have to pay the artists and record labels. And uh, yeah, so that, that's something that a lot of people mix up. You cannot not pay the writers and only pay the performers. 
that's not possible. Right. And I think on that note, Harry, I'd come back to you in terms of the, uh, the confusion of, uh, and we all understand it as master rights because we're playing a CD or, a record or, a st or streaming a song. Uh, what, as far as I know, one is PPL who really collects that license, but IPRS has now come back and said that, okay, we have the rights on the composition of the track, and then there's now ISRA. Is that really creating a confusion here in terms of, and how, how is one handling that? Is there anything that you've really seen uh, development in that case? No, definitely as a retailer um, or any uh, place where the public performance kind of music gets played, so there is a confusion amongst them that who all they have to pay. Historically, it has been always PPL, which has been uh, uh, charging and everyone has been paying. And IPRS was not registered under the Copyright Act, which has been done recently. Uh, the question the retailers are today asking, if I was paying 100 and now there are two, three agencies which are claiming and the rights are there. So there is legally IPRS has a claim on the rights. Now the question is whether it becomes 100 plus 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 or that 100 gets divided, gets divided amongst the agencies. So that's the confusion which is still prevalent and it is still under uh, various courts uh, are hearing these matters. So till the time that gets resolved, I think there is confusion in the market on who all have right to claim. Uh, there's something else that I would like to add to that. There's something called reciprocal rights, meaning that um, if you are a member of CSAC and IPRS was kicked out of CSAC recently, was readmitted to CSAC, at that moment they are allowed to um, represent the rights of the rest of the world. Basically all the other PROs who are a member of CSAC then grant their uh, permission that IPRS does not just uh, represent their own repertoire, but they also repre represent what we call the world repertoire. Oh, interesting. And I think one of the insights that I, and I was reading about is, uh, one is the confusion, Harry, that you're talking about. And second is, uh, uh, between IPRS and PPL, the total collection from the music licensing, particularly from a retail business, is uh, uh, around upwards or approximately 100 crores. And, but the important insight there is, it's only coming out of a five, less than 5% penetration in this retail market. And I think that means 95% uh, of the uh, uh, at times we don't know if our, if the right owners don't know if the song is actually being played in, in, that, in, uh, in, in a retail outlet. And on that note, Petal, I'd like to again come back to you in terms of understanding in this era where a, where a song is available on your, on your phone. And uh, I could be a retailer sitting, a mobile, a mobile retail outlet sitting out of Raipur, has a streaming platform that I would, and I could play that music and in, a, in my store. Is that legally right? And how do, I know that's not, but how, how, how is one supposed to really handle those things? Because that's the kind of penetration that still not happened in this country. And how is one working towards uh, helping that out? So, uh, Samit, like you said, of course, if a retailer is playing a song in his store, which is obviously for his consumers and customers, it's not legally um, allowed. So, it is something, if you're doing it without license, then it is something which is illegal. Uh, at the same time, what you're trying to also pinpoint is that how do we really uh, sort of control that? Yeah. The unfortunate part is that you really can't control it. Right now, how it's happening is, uh, is through physical raids, you know, these societies also uh, uh, carry out raids at these outlets and uh, uh, premises where these songs are played and then they, th that is how they basically, uh, you know, catch these infringements that are happening of their uh, copyrighted works. But uh, as of now, uh, electronically or uh, an easier way to find out or something which can control it or prevent it, Unfortunately, we don't have it as of now. But uh, yes, uh, like Harry said, there's a long way to go. And uh, maybe in the coming future, there are softwares that we can, uh, you know, uh, come up with. But at the moment, there is nothing. Okay. So, Petal, just to add on that, yeah. uh, th there is something in the sense that when we provide service, we work very closely with even the regulators on that point of view. Because when we deliver those services uh, digitally today, we have full log track record of which store in the country or anywhere in the world has played what track at what time. So all the logs we maintain at our end. So tomorrow if any music label wants to know okay, what kind of music is getting played and that's where the whole technology shift is happening, 
that earlier we used to send CDs and you know you take a blanket license. Sure. But today I can track down to a single artist, single uh, the song or the label, how many times it was played in a store, what time it was played. We have all the logs. So that's where we are, I think, working on where in the transparency in the whole ecosystem will come into play as well. So basically, if we have service providers like that, then yes, maybe we can prevent. But um, I mean, that's, that's where we're looking at. That there's a long way. <laughs> okay. And Harry, on that, uh, that note, do brands believe, is it, is it a cost or is it really something that they believe is working for them? How do they really come across when you give them a budget, okay, this much is, is going to be the license cost? Do they really see it as a cost or do they really see it as investment into something building customer experience? So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, brands, at least the organized retail companies, the large companies, they treat it as part of their doing a business. It's Fantastic. not a, seen as a large cost item. Uh, large cost item when it becomes, when uh, multiple agencies start uh, claiming on top of that, sure. then they start thinking of whether it is, you know, how do you take care of uh, this cost? Sure. Uh, today the cost is being levied on the basis of say per square foot of a retail environment. Okay. And then whether you are an Indian brand or a foreign brand, whether you are a multi-store or... So there are various permutation combinations. Got it. And uh, I think once that is simplified and the rates are rationalized, like today the stores are... Uh, each brand is a million square foot. You start multiplying the exact rack rates, that goes into crores. Right. And today every retailer is trying to working on, you know, a very thin margin. So they want to comply, but uh, these kind of then negotiations happen uh, with the PPL and IPRS, and they handle it directly. Right. But we ensure that whenever we are servicing a customer that the music is licensed, so the compliance increases and, to that. And actually brands don't mind paying uh, if, the, if, that, if that amount is going to the artist, because finally they are playing that track. No, on, no, on they, that, I think that acceptance is coming in. Yeah. Um, it is uh, drilled down to the single store and mom and pop show stores, that I think is still, it will take some time. But organized retail uh, top end all take licenses. So okay. They are complying with the regulations to that extent. Okay. And Sharad? If I yeah. may pitch in on that, yeah. uh, is uh, that cost is actually, one is it's the cost of doing business and it just is, uh, we're not experts at it, number one. Right. Uh, and that's why, you know, it, it, it just helps to let somebody else, let an expert do that uh, uh, and we just have a, uh, lesser liability then. You know, it just is no liability on me that I'm not doing something right. Uh, 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 so that way, I think it's, it's a cost worth, uh, as, as a business, I feel it's a cost worth giving into. Got it. And Samit, just to add on, now, we are not just playing music as, you know, as a service provider, I'm just curating music. True. We are branding the music channel as, hey, you are listening to Lifestyle Radio, hey, you are listening to Titan Radio. So there is a brand connect after every song, after two songs, there is a brand connect happening with the consumers on the floor. Right. And then they announce about their product launches. So they are using this medium along with music, music as the product knowledge distribution as well. And I think that's that's the same trend happening when it comes to even live experiences, uh, which I'm a part of. Uh, you know, brands like Red Bull or Budweiser, the Red Bull has been doing Red, uh, RBMA Music Academy for years. I know it has a new avatar now, but they're trying to build a culture around it. And uh, probably they're going to be uh, showcasing a film that they've done on, on uh, a documentary that they've done on Divine uh, uh, during this conference. Similarly, Budweiser internationally investing into, investing in festivals and music concerts really believing and that's a research, a, a clear research that says 63% or 63 of the audience that really attend festivals and concerts or other music concerts uh, connect with the brands who really sponsor those events and that's a great insight for any brand to really have in and that's why I think brands are creating culture around this. But what's, what's more important is transparency that when you're creating this culture, when you're actually playing this music, the final... Uh, uh, you know, the rights and the licensing and the amount has to go to the final artist and that transparency is quite important to really build in and I think that I would keep it as the last conversa uh, conversation between
between us because we've just uh, finishing our conversation. Uh, uh, Yuri, on that front, how, how do we build this transparency? And I, I had one idea while we're discussing that if really today, if there is any outlet and today BMC or anybody who gives the permission for a, for a venue or an outlet or a retail outlet, if they really make this important for anybody to have a monitoring system like a DJ monitor, so we actually, every, all these retail outlets, we would get to know and you would be able to monitor. That would create some kind of a transparency in the whole, uh, you know, music retail business. Uh, is there something like this happening in internationally and is, uh, that you guys are working on? Well, basically, uh, we work uh, uh, with the PROs, the performance rights organizations in uh, New Zealand, in Australia, in the USA, in uh, Germany, UK, uh, France, Belgium, Netherlands, etc. So this is internationally accepted. Uh, we've really set our sights now on, on India because I think that um, this market needs to um, uh, be clear on what it is that they're actually paying for. And um, I think that uh, through MRT we can create data and through data we can create transparency once again. So, um, uh, and it should be it should go both ways. This is what we do in Europe as well. We work both for the, the, the transparency of uh, distribution towards the artists and, and rights owners, um, authors, etc. But we also work for transparency towards venues and uh, events, meaning that our efforts have led up to legislation actually in Europe where, uh, for instance, uh, a judge has made rulings in, in Belgium based on the, the work that we've done with uh, entities like uh, Tomorrowland, etc. In which um, basically the judge said, well listen, you cannot charge 100% if you do not represent 100%. And sure. through our data we could see like, oh, they only represent 67%. Therefore, it, you know, it's now obliged to cut it into smaller tranches of let's say 70% uh, uh, so they only have to pay 70% of that fee instead of 100%. So I think that transparency should work both ways. And I think that transparency, Harry, would really bring our costs also down with retailers if we really have the information on the tracks being played and then actual, uh, we could pay, instead of paying for the blanket, which we at times we would be only using 40, 50% of the repertoire. And uh, if we could really understand that this is the track being played and that monitoring system could really make it more transparent for all, all of us and really help the whole licensing uh, concern that's coming up. Uh, on that note, I think, do we have time for Q&A? Do we have time for Q&A? Okay, no problem. So, no? Okay, so thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, uh, our panelists, and thank you for hearing us out while we had lots to talk and a lot of other conversations, points to bring in. But uh, we are running short of time, so thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the day.